Hi, everybody. This is the Rocky Mountain Myrick Short Takes on Suicide Prevention podcast. I'm Adam Hoffberg, and today we are broadcasting from the American Association of Suicidology Conference here in Phoenix. I'm really excited. We're getting to sit down with Dr. Julie Goldstein Grummet. She is with the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, and she's the Director of Behavioral Health and Health Initiatives, which is all part of the Education Development Center. Welcome, Julie. We're going to talk today about zero suicide, and we're really excited to have you. Thank you for having me, Adam. Great. So before we jump into zero suicide, which is, of course, a big topic these days, we'd just like to get to know you a little bit and uh, tell us your pathway to how you got involved with this movement. Great. Well, really, the impetus was the Clinical Care and Intervention Task Force of the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention. The Action Alliance launched in 2010, and one of the first task forces was the Clinical Care and Intervention Task Force, led by Mike Hogan and David Covington, who really said, what is healthcare doing to work with people at risk for suicide? The national strategy, the first one from 2002, focused a lot on communities and schools. But till then, we really hadn't focused on health care. When we refer people to health care systems, are they going to get quality, evidence-based, competent care? And so that's goals eight and nine of the national strategy. That task force released a report of recommendations looking at some systems who had begun to really implement best practices in health care. And when I came to the Suicide Prevention Resource Center then in 2012, they said, let's think about how to operationalize some of these recommendations. There were a few states starting to look at that that type of work, and so I began to lead some learning collaboratives, really began to learn from some of the early pioneers in this work, and then in the last few years, it's really exploded as we've seen some really great evidence emerge that this robust system works. Fantastic, and we're going to get into a little bit more of the data around what you all have seen so far. Just touching on a little bit of what you said, so this idea that you wanted a national or some guidance that could help many communities rather than having each one do it piecemeal, or could you explain a little bit more about that? Zero suicide is a set of practices and policies, and it's also at this point a set of tools that we've provided on our toolkit, zerosuicide.com. People don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of really wonderful expertise out there from some of, the, of, of our national experts who serve as faculty and others who have taken up this work. And yet, for each healthcare system or each state, it does have to be tweaked. It does have to be adapted for the system and the population in which they work. So it's both. Um, and there's some really wonderful work happening in states and across healthcare systems, but it looks a little bit different if it's primary care or emergency departments or a hospital system or a health plan trying to enter this work. All of them have a place in zero suicide, but it's not going to be an exact menu. Excellent. I'm I'm glad you mentioned the toolkit, and I definitely want to come back to that in just a little bit. Uh, First, I want to talk a little bit more about what is the movement and, and what does it mean for zero suicide to be the goal? A lot of folks have described it as transformative and audacious and and sort of helping us move this needle where suicide has been a growing problem. But there's some nuance to that zero suicide also. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. I do think that's one of the first questions people ask. Can you really do zero suicide? Or I'm really uncomfortable with the name. I'm going to have a really hard time getting buy-in from our staff if they feel that they have to get to zero. So the, of course the goal is always zero. That's what we want. We want there to be no suicides in the U.S. or internationally for that matter. You have to have set an ambitious, audacious goal. I don't think that saying reducing suicides by 20% is what we want to aim for. That's great, but there's still then people dying by suicide. So what this says is that until we get to zero, there are constantly policies, trainings, ways to do continuous quality improvement to get better. Is there really a better number? When I've worked with healthcare systems who struggle with this, I've said... If your loved one, your brother, your wife was struggling with thoughts of suicide, would you feel without a doubt that you could refer them to your health care system confidently, not a doubt in your mind that every step along the way they would get the best quality care known to mankind in suicide? Most systems kind of pause. Most providers pause and say, I think we do really good care, really great care, but maybe not best optimal in every single corner of of the imagination. And that's what this is about, is how do we fill in the gaps that currently exist in the healthcare system for people at risk for suicide? Yeah, that's really helpful in thinking of it as this aspirational goal and something to truly work towards, but not something to dissuade people from getting involved. That's exactly it, is what we're not looking to blame. 
people if a suicide does occur. So it's not zero suicides or bust or you're fired. That's not the goal. The goal is if we're not at zero, what can we do to improve the care that we're providing? And not to single out a clinician when a suicide does happen, but that it's a system error, that there's something within the system that we can shore up, whether it's a policy or a training or a practice, and that that should be our agency-wide goal, not to run away from it out of fear of when a suicide happens, but rather we can learn from a suicide in the event that it does happen, and we continually, as an agency, should all want zero. That's why we got into this work, is to improve the care and the lives of the people that we serve. Excellent. And that's a great segue into this idea that's a systems level approach and and we're not blaming clinicians, we're not blaming individual uh, aspects of that. Could you talk a little bit more about what that means to be a systems level approach? You already talked a little bit about some of the players involved. Just kind of get into that a little bit for us. I think historically for psychologists and social workers and psychiatrists, we each do really great work behind closed door, kind of one-on-one, patient to provider. And that's people have done heroic work with people at risk for suicide, really quality, impassioned work that has saved lives. And yet, what happens when your provider's away? What happens when your provider retires? What happens when you get assigned to the person in the room next door who maybe their passion is substance abuse or something else and they don't know as much about suicide care? It's not that they don't care as much, but perhaps they didn't have the same level of training. They don't know about the best and evidence-based practices. You need a system behind you to really support the work that you do. It's If it's embedded in your electronic health record and you can't, Uh, proceed to the next question without checking off the box that you've screened somebody, that you've done a safety plan, that you've, that somebody who screens positive gets a same day risk assessment. As I said, that you've done a safety plan, that you've discussed lethal means counseling. And then you go back and you say, did we do all the things that we said we were going to do? That's the system behind it. So that if you're not at a hundred percent, you can say, what's, what's the error? Is it time? Is it staff knowledge? Why are we not doing this as well? If I'm doing it and only 30% of my clients are getting a safety plan, but Adam, you know, 80% of your clients are getting a safety plan on the same day, what can I learn from you, right? So that's really the idea of the shared system-wide experience, that we share our knowledge, that we continuously look at our data to figure out how to improve, and we provide a stronger safety net for people at risk rather than relying on an individual provider. So you said some great points there, and I'd like to follow up on just two of them. One is the idea of the safety net. So let's start there. I've heard the Swiss cheese model of talking about zero suicide, and I don't think we could have a discussion without a mention. So could you talk us through the Swiss cheese model and what the filling in the gaps is all about? So that was adapted from James Reason, uh, who talks about that within healthcare there are holes like a picture a piece of swiss cheese there are holes in it well if those holes multiple pieces of swiss cheese line up and the holes line up just so a person can fall through the cracks so we've adapted those that model and we use those slides in a lot of our training but it really highlights the idea that this is where the gaps occur in the healthcare system and this framework these seven dimensions of zero suicide fill in those gaps so that people don't fall in the in the holes of Swiss cheese. The model, as I started to describe earlier, is the idea that you have present screening for anybody who comes into healthcare. You have screening at multiple times. Somebody who's seen in your system for six months, 12 months, things change. So you have to have multiple points at which you screen them. You need to do a risk assessment. If you know that somebody's at risk for suicide, you have to know are they at risk and what is the next step in our care plan for this individual. Everybody at risk for suicide should have a safety plan that's designed collaboratively with the clinician that is meaningful to the person and is individually driven and something they will actually use if everybody's safety plan in a healthcare system looks exactly the same. We're all going to take a bath, walk our dog, and write in our journal. That's probably unrealistic That in terms of what's going to work for every person across the board. We have to discuss lethal means and whether or not the person has access, and we need to remove and reduce access to lethal means. We need to provide evidence-based treatment that directly targets the thoughts of suicide. We need to follow up when people are discharged between providers or from a hospital to to an outpatient provider. Do we know that they go? Just because we hand them a slip of paper with a name, address, and phone number doesn't mean that they go, and we, we often don't follow up, and then we blame it on the individual. 
And finally, you have to really, as we started to talk about, look at your data and say, are we doing all of those pieces with fidelity? And if not, how do we fix that? And that closes those gaps in the system and that, that makes your Swiss cheese whole again. Fantastic explanation. And so taking this sort of from the abstract to like a sort of a real world example, I understand that this model sort of emerged from the Henry Ford health system on um, what they called perfect depression cares. Could you talk us a little bit about that exemplar and how it guided zero suicide? When Henry Ford Health System first started out, they actually weren't looking to improve suicide care. They were looking to improve depression care. And as they grappled with what would that look like and is it a better score on certain inventories around depression, they said that's good, but it's really not good enough. A lot of this came from guidance from others as they were looking to receive various grant awards who said that's not sufficient, do better. So they sat back down and said, what would it look like? And one of the nurses in the room said, I guess if we were providing perfect depression care, nobody would die by suicide. And that was a really incredible and powerful moment for that system who said, can that be done? Should we actually take that on? What would that look like? There was a lot of fear in the room, but it from, I wasn't in the room at the time, but from what I understand, it was also very powerful and motivating. And everything sort of rallied around that at that point. How do you get close to zero? How do you really strive to provide better suicide care? And since then, many of the tenants that I was describing were embedded in their system. The idea of robust screening, really robust performance improvement, really ensuring that access to lethal means had been reduced. That continues now. They began their program in the early 2000s, around 2002. They continue with the same sustained energy now that they had then. And they reduce suicide by about 75% for those in their care. So this is a population of people already at increased risk because of their um, diagnoses of of mental health and substance-related issues. And yet they've reduced their rates of suicide down to about the national, what about the national averages? So about 11 per 100,000 or 13 per 100,000. They even had several quarters of zero. So we know it can be done. We've tried to learn a lot from them and take their best practices and instill them in many of our tools and our consultation and our teaching. Um, And several other systems are beginning to see that type of improvement as well. Great. Thank you. And just to follow up on this idea that, you know, it's moving into other systems and how other folks can get involved or how they can bring their healthcare system online. You already um, mentioned the toolkit. Could you talk about a little bit how that process might look for folks who might be interested in bringing zero suicide to their community? I think one of the most important features of a zero suicide initiative is leadership. You have to have leadership committed to this type of system-wide change to robust quality improvement, and that this is going to be a marathon, not a sprint. It is not something that you can take on this year and after 12 months say, good, we're done, we're moving on, and now we're on to the next thing. This is something about system-wide change that will constantly be in front of you because you can constantly do better. So if leadership isn't really going to have that type of sustained commitment, attention, willingness to change, willingness to provide new policies and, and activities, then it's probably not the right system. But there are many leaders out there who have been willing to do this. And then there are champions within each of those healthcare systems, people who have been personally affected by suicide or impassioned at the idea that suicide care can change. It doesn't have to be the way it's been for the last 20 years. Leadership should enlist those champions particularly people with lived experience. They want to tell their stories. They've had incredible experiences, sometimes for the good and sometimes for not good. Um, We need to listen to people with lived experience and let them participate in the conversation as a staff member, whether they come from the community or not, because they really, of course, want to see that system change. The toolkit provides a lot of tools for how to get started, uh, about how to put a team together, an implementation team that meets often to do this work. It has a lot of tools about self-assessments. How's our organization look by comparison to what would be sort of optimal? Um, And the toolkit's available at zerosuicide.com. There's a lot of resources on that website, both about what is zero suicide, sort of just the philosophical understanding of what it would mean to do zero suicide and why. And then there's a toolkit within that website that has the tools to operationalize zero suicide. Great, and we'll definitely put links up along with this podcast so you can um, explore the Zero Suicide Toolkit and all the resources on the website. Julie, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Before we let you go, do you have any closing thoughts on where suicide's headed or just, yeah, just thoughts to our listeners on why this movement's so important? 
Thanks, Adam. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and all of your listeners. I think this is a movement in its infancy. I think it's we're now at maybe the, you know, we're only a few years out from when it started, so it's pretty incredible to me to see the tidal wave that this has become of people adopting this. As I said, we've seen several healthcare systems that have begun to really improve their suicide efforts, and a lot of individuals within those healthcare systems who said, this really reinvigorated my passion to do this work. So I think it's a wonderful time. I think that this, I've never worked in a community of such kind and generous individuals. There's an incredible listserv, the Zero Suicide Listserv, where people share their experiences, their thoughts, their resources, their research. And I really encourage your listeners to sign up for that listserv because, as I said, I've never worked with such a community of individuals who want this to be successful, who want to share their resources, learn from one another, both both their successes and, without a doubt, their, their failures and get past them and do better so that we can really improve the lives of people who come in seeking our help and know that we're doing the best job that we can. So it's exciting to be a part of this, and I appreciate all of the people who have um, mentored me so much to be able to continue to share this this work and, and share it with you today. Great. Well, that's extremely well said, and I understand you're giving a Zero Suicide Academy here at the AAS conference today. So, you know, just spreading the word and getting the word out, and we really appreciate that. So listeners, thank you for joining us today. You can learn more about Dr. Grummet and all the exciting work at Zero Suicide by clicking on the links accompanying the podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, give us a listen and a review and uh, share with your colleagues. Until next time, this has been the Short Takes on Suicide Prevention Podcast. Thank you.